Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to this episode of New Books and Intellectual History, part of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Thomas Kingston, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Carl Vanerlind, Professor of History and Chair of Barnard College and Columbia University, and Frederick Albert Jonsson, Associate Professor of British History, Conceptual and Historical Study of Science at the University of Chicago. It's wonderful to have both authors here to talk about their newly released book from Harvard University Press entitled Scarcity, A History from the Origins of Capitalism to the Climate Crisis. Great to have you here. Thanks so much, Thomas. Great to be here. Thank you. I mean, the first question, um, and this is really a wonderful book. Um, I think that you strike a, a really good balance between uh, conveying information that covers such a broad period of time and a broad period of thinkers and disciplines. Um, and I mean, I was particularly uh, interested in how you brought in like literature and, uh, and, and, and these disciplines that maybe aren't necessarily always thought of as intellectual history. I mean, because it, it is, as you specify in the introduction, a genealogy of, of, of thought. Um, yet it obviously has very uh, contemporary relevance. Um, so I guess the the big and obvious question is, was there a eureka movement that really got two authors? Because obviously it's a co-authored book. It's, it's very easy for one author to get that eureka moment and sit down and write, but to have two authors to come together and do that, or was it a more a gradual process over time? So um, Frederick and I are, are both British historians early modern British historians. We're also intellectual historians. And it also so happens that we are both uh, Swedish and spend our summers in Sweden and um, tend to get together and talk about our various projects. Um, So a number of years ago, we had both finished our first monographs. And both of these books were engaging the relationship between science and economy. Um, and on our respective ends, we were thinking about writing something that was a bit more broadly applicable and uh, that kind of captured, um, you know, different ideas of thinking about history and how it might be applied to the present. Um, So we talked further about this and we realized that we're essentially writing the same book. Uh, I was coming at it from the prism of the idea of scarcity, which I had written my dissertation on. And Frederick was coming at this from the idea of cornucopianism, the idea of abundance that he uh, had written a number of articles on. So we then started talking about doing this project together. And it turned out that we had you know, just amazingly complementary skills you know, a little overlap here and there, but it really was a, a, was a nice fit. Um, and we were also drawn to this project uh, by, you know, a joint concern and, and, and fear really about what was happening to, you know, capitalism in general, but in more in particular, uh, the environment. Um, Frederick, if you want to pick it up from there. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, Eureka moments are, um, uh, I guess, conceptually, um, Eureka moments happen, uh, you know, when you when you're, when you're working on your dissertation, when you're working on your first book, there might be turning points. Um, But in some way, I think, there wasn't ever a eureka moment for me. There, there's always been a keen interest in in how environment and economy go together. That and this goes back to my childhood and youth in in Stockholm. I think uh, being shaped by by just the the tenor of the times in the seven you know late seventies, uh, early eighties. Um, you know, a string of natural disasters, a kind of incipient awareness of environmental constraints, the limits to growth debate. Um, some of that um, vanished in the 90s. Um, you know, we got preoccupied with a cultural turn and, and other things. Um, but it was always there for me, this, this awareness of climate change and biodiversity loss. 
Um, and I was always puzzled by the relative absence of interest in these questions from colleagues in early modern history, with some notable exceptions. But, um, you know, even environmental historians were relatively slow on picking up on this question of climate change. Um, much of it, I think, if there was a eureka moment, it was... Uh, beginning to collaborate with my dear friend and colleague Dipesh Chakrabarti at the University of Chicago, who was really, as a South Asianist voice in in intellectual history and social theory, has has um, more or less single handedly put the Anthropocene and um, questions of the planetary on the map. You know, in in the environmental humanities and in, in the social sciences more broadly. Uh, so if I, you know, um, if if I had to pinpoint an influence, it's it's probably these conversations with Depeche uh, that I began having in you know 2007, 2008. We co-taught a course on climate change and the carbon cycle, and then another one on Marx and Marx's ecology. Um, so that's you know uh, th- that's my perspective on on the beginnings of the project. Well, and if I can add to that a little bit. So this was very much a, a, a pandemic book. Um, we um, spent a lot of time on Zoom um, discussing these ideas and working out these chapters. There was a lot of back and forth in the writing. Um, there's not a single chapter that's written solely by one author or the other. Uh, and um, given that there is a sort of a, a lack of academic sociability during the pandemic, uh, the writing of this book really played an important role in in keeping us, um, you know, happy and and content and moving in a, in a good direction. So uh, it, it, it's written in in a fairly peculiar uh, mental state, uh, if you would, um, uh, but but one that was. Um, uh, you know, to both of us, really a lifeline during some very difficult times. Yeah, I mean, that actually really brings me on to the the next question is because obviously the book is focused on scarcity. Um, And I think quite a lot of people will be familiar with the notion of scarcity, but in, I guess, in a, we might say a layman's terms, uh, as in a shortage or an absence. And during COVID in the UK, we saw scarcity of toilet paper uh, and these sorts of things as people went on these sprees buying things. But the book actually has a, a much uh, broader approach um, or, I mean, I think I think it's more of an approach than a definition. Um, and I think to understand the book, it's obviously necessary first to understand this because this isn't just a history of shelves being empty or famines. This is a, a, a much more holistic um and, and, and engaged, um, uh, like, uh, a pr- prism to view things through. Yeah, absolutely c- correct. So, th- th- um, you know, it, as you're saying, it, it, it's not about specific moments of actual experienced shortage. Um, it's, it's much more about how different philosophers, economists, and political thinkers, how they have thought um, about and how they conceptualize the relationship between economy and nature. What the, and, and, and what we're interested in is, is really the kind of popular understanding of this. And at the moment, what really shapes the way that the world thinks about economy and nature comes out of neoclassical economics. And neoclassical economics assumes that everything in the world is scarce. And to some extent, that's of course true because space and time are by definition limited, but that's not really the definition they employ. Uh, They make the assumption that all human beings are constantly wanting more, not necessarily more of every good, but they want more in general. And they make the assumption that anything can be turned into anything else through the market, an assumption they call fungibility. And that means that people are insatiable, they have insatiable desires, and that everything is therefore valued because it can be turned into something else. If you start actually running uh, short of any particular resource, 
There's also belief in substitutability, that prices of those goods will go up and that that will make it profitable for entrepreneurs and scientists to come up with substitutes. So here is a worldview in which everything is scarce all the time, yet it's possible to always grow further and further and further. So the, the primary mindset is one in which you are logically drawn to economic growth as a solution to the human predicament. And economic growth has, of course, created you know, some amazing material uh, prosperity in various parts of the world, in particular the global north. Uh, but we're, of course, now running into a variety of constraints and climate and biodiversity being just two of those. There's, of course, various other tipping points. So to operate in a world in which, in which economic growth is the solution to every economic, social and political problem is no lo longer a tenable condition. But in order to develop the kind of tools that we need to think about solutions in the future, we need to emancipate ourselves from that very narrow worldview in which scarcity governs everything in the world. Uh, and what our book is, is offering is a set of alternatives, not that can be picked up and, and, and applied to the conditions that we're in at the, at the present, but that might stimulate thought and encourage others to recognize that alternatives are possible. And that by seeing the variety of different ways in which people have thought about the economy and nature and nexus in the past, that we can you know, encourage others to think in creative ways and to, um, to embolden them to denaturalize the present, um, um, the, the present way of thinking and to embark on new, new ways of thinking about the economy-nature relationship uh, that might enable us to promote a thriving of human and non-human organisms on Earth. Perhaps um, another way of putting this is um, that when we look to the past, uh, we can trace not one simple lineage, but a series of quite distinctive approaches to the relation between nature and the economy or put a little bit differently, between nature and desire, um, right? And that may be the main contribution of this book, is to, is to consistently pay attention to how that relation is changing over time. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you just, for, for the sake of... Um, um, for the sake of um, a historical um, clarity, one, one case for this, very different from neoclassical uh, imaginations of scarcity, would be romanticism and the romantic idea of nature and the romantic idea of desire. Um, uh, those of you in the audience from the UK uh, may be very familiar with the lakes uh, and in particular Wordsworth's home in, in, in the Lake District, uh, Dove Cottage. Uh, now, Dove Cottage was designed to be deliberately a, a, a simple place to live, a simple rustic place. Um, in, Wordsworth, uh, in Wordsworth's worldview, uh, nature was finite uh, in, in resources, um, but this wasn't a tragedy because desire uh, was, um, um, was meant to be simple. Um, human fulfillment uh, was really to be had in the non-material world, in the transcendental, aesthetic, and ethical properties of nature. Um, and so Dove Cottage was designed to to create a kind of a, a small sanctuary, a space to live, but oriented outward towards Grasmere and towards the lakes, towards mm -hmm. the, the peasant society there and, and what, um, what William and Dorothy perceived to be uh, a kind of ideal world of community and labor and simple, mm -hmm. simple living, right? So you see very clearly how... Uh, you know, they were on the one hand making assumptions about nature and on the other hand thinking about the economy and human desire in a very specific way. 
in, in our book, romantic, this romantic conception of scarcity is only one of a dozen or so of forms of scarcity that we, uh, that we, uh, excavate from uh, Western tradition starting around 1500 and going up to the present. And I guess maybe I can add a, a, just a little bit of a backdrop to that as well. So when, when we think about neoclassical economics as, as a, and, and, and its assumption of insatiability, there's, there's been a great deal of success of that worldview to the point where people have in some ways internalized that idea that humanity is uh, boundless in, 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 in its desires and that people actually do want more all the time. But we show in this book that that particular understanding of desires is a, is a historically contingent one. It's generated at a particular moment um, and uh, there's been, you know, a, a continuous effort to kind of inculcate that notion and to teach people not only that it's okay, but it's natural to be that way. But there are, are as many different worldviews in the past in which the idea of boundless desires is just incompatible with what it means to be a good human and to live a decent life. So, um, Again, the, 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 what we're trying to do by showing the different ideas of thinking about nature and different ideas of thinking about desires is to really problematize the, 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 uh, the stability and the, the, the sort of general acceptance of the fundamental assumptions of neoclassical economics. And, you know, um, there's going to be neoclassical economists who will say, while there are various different ways in which neoclassical economists think about this, but we are mostly concerned with the, 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 the basic understanding that comes out of neoclassical economics that's taught in Economics 101. Uh, because that's the kind of thinking that makes it into the social fabric. Because the students who have sat through a number of economics classes at university uh, they're the ones who are now journalists, who are politicians, who are business leaders, who are out there uh, and using the, the basic framework provided by neoclassical economics and its basic assumptions. And it's those, it's that way of thinking that we see as a, a hindrance to more creative ways of thinking about um, solutions to um, problems facing um, capitalism and environment today. I mean that re that really comes through in the book. I mean it it strikes a very nice balance of being informative but also inspirational um, by emphasising that there was a pluralistic uh, past that where there wasn't this sort of m monopolization of ideology. Like it, it it got me thinking of the the John Carpenter film They Live with the when when he puts the glasses on and it says consume, consume. Uh which which once again makes this book so relevant to the wider audience because this is something that we engage with and take for granted. And I think also the fact that you're bringing in um cultural figures and cultural thought that people will be familiar with. I mean um uh, uh, like Wordsworth's poems are like taught at school, and, and and in the book you also bring in Shakespeare to, to sort of explore these dynamics um, that we don't necessarily think about in that way. Um, that we don't think about as an alternative. We've sort of whether it was intentional or not, they've successfully been sort of partitioned off into just a cultural figure. Um, I mean, and 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 as the books focus on Western thought. It really, uh, obviously, a lot of this originates from Judeo-Christian um, and sort of Hell Hell Hellenistic philosophy, um, and, and that's very obvious at the start. You have Thomas More, you have uh, Martin Luther, you have Quakers, the, all of these um, religiously guided figures that, um, that, in a way, by turning to the third party of a, a higher power, or a, what, whatever um, term they are, that they give to that, in a way, use that as their rule book for mediating their relationship with nature, environment, and um, the material goods. But in the book, you also speak about how this 
has lasted a lot longer, um, which I think might come as a slight surprise to people who don't really think about a religious legacy in our economic understanding of the economy or um, the environment. Um, yeah, there are several threads running through the book that are worth emphasizing. Um, one is, um, as you just mentioned, um, uh, recovering this um, pre-modern worldview of um, finite nature and finite desire um, framed by a Christian and um, monarchical, hierarchical way of thinking about the world. Um, that worldview was challenged uh, in the 17th century by um, philosophers and alchemists. Um, and so we trace the beginnings of a heretical and, and, and completely, in, in many ways, an, an absurd new idea um, that infinite desires were a good thing and that uh, nature was a was a storehouse of resources that man could conquer um, with divine sanction um, that humans were put on earth to dominate it. Um, now it is true that Judeo Christian tradition has an aspect of domination built into it from you know the Book of Genesis, um, but in our interpretation, the 17th century really marks. A great threshold um, where the whole idea of the of human mastery of nature, and obviously um, particularly European elite mastery of nature, um, with an ugly colonial and imperial dimension, of course, um, this uh, uh, this worldview emerges and is sanctioned by uh, intellectual elites in the 17th century, and and. Uh, becomes really um, uh, mainstream in some ways by the late 19th and the 20th centuries. So, so we insist on telling a long durée story about how infinite growth went from an absurd idea to something common sense. Now we live with the idea of infinite growth as basically the unquestioned basis of our economy as well as politics, um, but it wasn't always so. Uh, but throughout uh, this 500-year history of, of, uh, of um, cornucopian uh, philosophy, or 400-year history of cornucopian philosophy, we also have uh, oppositional movements, like uh, the Romantic moment that I just described. Um, um, and uh, one of the um, other lessons of the book is that these oppositional ideologies have persisted and they are available still uh, not to be revived uh, wholesale from the past. You know, we're not we're not just going to go out and live like Wordsworth in, the, in Dove Cottage at this point. Um, that's impossible. But uh, a lot of these oppos oppositional ideologies uh, remain available for at least partial appropriation, selective appropriation. And uh, to give you an example of this, um, some of the most important resistance to neoclassical economics uh, you'll find in, on the one hand, um, ecological Christianity, um, which you might think of as reviving uh, some elements of the 16th century worldview. Think of Pope Francis radical ecological message in Laudato Si. Uh, a second current um, that picks up on the past is um, the degrowth mo movement, um, both in America and in Europe. This idea of embracing simple living, conviviality, um, private austerity, public luxury is one of the mottos of the movement. Um, that in some ways is, I think, uh, reviving a romantic heritage. And then thirdly, um, the, the new version of Marxism that's captured the imagination of young people, in, uh, especially in the academic world. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the attempt to, to understand Marxism from an ecological point of view by people like Jason Moore and Andreas Malm. Um, that obviously picks up on Marxian thought, but also reshapes it to to or orient it towards uh, the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene, as they like to call it. 
I, I, yeah, let, let me very briefly just add um, that, you know, the book is really trying to capture a series of worldviews, right? And most of our effort is to kind of capture the, the, the how, you know, nature, the environment, economy and desire, how they're depicted in these worldviews. But given the importance of religion, um, th- there's there's a way, inevitable way in which religion really shapes and structures th- th- these worldviews that we're talking about. Sometimes more, sometimes a little less, sometimes they're real efforts to kind of move beyond the kind of spirituality or religiosity. Uh, but but it finds its way back in. And even though it's not pronounced, it you can see it nestled there uh, in various places. And, and I guess a, a larger, broader point about these worldviews, uh, the way that we have structured the book is that it appears as though these worldviews sort of emerge, become dominant, and then they disappear, and then it's replaced by some other worldview. Uh, and, and we make it quite clear in the beginning that that's, of course, not how the world evolves. Uh, what happens is that these worldviews emerge, uh, they're contested, they turn, they, they turn into to, to, to other versions. Uh, there might be a replacement, something, some other worldview might be popularized. But, but these worldviews are kind of nestled in the social fabric and they're constantly there and people appeal to them in various ways. Uh, and they are always, um, you know, plastic enough to be applicable to each era. Um, so the way to read this book is to, is, is, uh, is to be offered a, a kind of a smorgasbord with different worldviews. But the reader, him or herself, needs to sort of keep that in mind that they are they never quite go away. They're 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 always there in some guise or other. Yeah, I mean, I think that that sort of becomes um, apparent, especially as you like, as you say, it's, it starts at you mentioned this at the start of the book, but by the end, you can sort of see this these threads like splitting and rejoining, and sort of themes being resurrected. Um, uh, and I mean, I think that this idea that this idea of like an infinite. Uh, and like a domination thing comes out uh, and, and sort of intertwines because obviously initially the domination thing is you know your place um, in the hierarchy and then eventually it becomes well, your place in the hierarchy is at the top so sort of do what you will um, and I mean we see thinkers in the book um, almost inverting um, the, the, the sort of fallen nature of man um, because I mean I know you start you start speaking about how it's part of the sort of baggage of original sin and the fall from Eden that we have to work. And then we, we see thinkers coming about at really at the start of this uh, sort of cornucopian uh, phase who are saying, okay, we are fallen, but let's just have a good time. Like, let's make the most of this. Like it's okay. Let's exploit things. And it doesn't really take that long until there's a reaction against that. I mean, I was, um, I was particularly struck by sort of, parallels we see with sort of things like the south sea bubble and louisiana bubble um i mean it it, it made me think a lot of um i mean some listeners might have have issues with this but it made me think a lot of sort of cryptocurrency and how we don't think like the environmental factors about that that have been brought up that there's this sort of like the immense electricity involved in bitcoin mining um and the bubbles that result from that. So, but but so I mean, but what was interesting about that for me was that the react the reaction to this to the bubble popping was not uh, a return to the previous way of things, but instead we got, we got novel thought. We got people like Daniel Defoe writing, and we got people like Jonathan Swift. So, when we get this first reaction to sort of speculation and credit and, and sort of big finance, um, I was wondering if you could talk about a little bit more about what form that really took. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me let me go back to 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 a little bit what what Frederick was was describing before with with this idea of cornucopian abundance and the idea of infinite growth, in particular infinite improvement, which came out of was inspired by Francis Bacon, who wrote in the beginning of the 17th century, and um, it was picked up by a group of intelligencers and improvers called the Hartlib Circle. Uh, And they were millenarian uh, uh, um, uh, Protestant uh, 
devotees who, uh, who really believed that God had given humanity uh, an infinite treasure and uh, it wouldn't be automatically handed to humanity, but humanity had to decipher the source code. Uh, and the way to do that was through painstaking experimental and empirical studies, and it had to be collaborative, and it had to ideally involve everyone around the globe. Uh, so the idea was to have a universal improvement uh, in order to foster a universal ref, re, uh, reformation. And for that to be possible, you needed a universal language. You wanted to, to kind of piece together everything that had been lost at the Tower of Babel when 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 um, humanity was punished for, for its hubris. Um, and the way that Bacon and the Hartlib Circle envisioned this process was basically the creation of research campuses where there would be laboratories and scientists working together, sharing knowledge, and that that would kind of unleash um, this, this enormous abundance that lay dormant in nature. So all of a sudden, nature was no longer this kind of rub, rugged, scant punishment by punishment for, 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 um, for, for original sin. But it was now this kind of abundance, this storehouse, this treasure that humanity just had to unlock with knowledge. And at the same time, or soon thereafter, now that it was no longer necessary to curtail desires to be to balance this the the the, the sort of limits of nature, um, people like Mandeville and Barben started thinking about infinite desires as really not being immoral problem or spiritual problem, but rather something that would draw uh, and serve as, a, as an engine for this, this infinite um, investigation of nature and therefore the creation of this universal abundance. And this was something that would happen in England and France, but throughout the world, really. And they viewed them themselves and their colonial enterprises as a sort of gift giving, that they would bring this knowledge to um, people around the world who were unaware of what kind of um, abundance they had available to them should they only have the right knowledge. So that way of thinking in the latter part of the 17th century fueled this incredible vision of abundance in the future. And if you add then the financial revolution to that, the idea of actually moving wealth from the future to the present through credit, it created this, this euphoria um, and it was this euphoria that led to the stock market speculations uh, on the South Sea Company and the Mississippi Company. And this, of course, came crashing down in a just a remarkable crash uh, in uh, 1720. So what's interesting then with people like Jonathan Swift and Daniel Defoe and how they reacted to this is that they uh, criticized both the kind of selfishness of the that 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 was uh, the selfishness that was was valorized by Mandeville and others, uh, and they also criticized this hubristic uh, faith in the in the power of science. So Jonathan Swift in Gulliver's Travels, for example, comes to one of the islands and he observes all of these pro projectors and improvers who are engaged in various projects to improve the conditions of humanity, and the ones that he lists are. Uh, you know, one scientist who's trying to extract sunbeams from cucumbers, another was trying to build, find a way to build uh, houses from the roof down. Um, another was uh, was to try to reduce human excrement into the original food. Uh, they were also trying to feed spiders colorful food so that they would spin uh, multicolored uh, webs that could then be used as textiles. So there was this immediate reaction um, to the, 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 the optimism. Uh, there was a way to kind of try to point out the, the madness of this and that this is not something that could be a sustainable path or that infinite improvement was actually available to humanity. But even though there's a massive amount of criticism in the begin, in, in the aftermath of these bubbles, there's something really appealing to political thinkers, economic thinkers, and philosophers. This, this idea that you know, maybe 
selfishness and greed can be instrumentalized and operationalized in a way that can improve economic conditions that could generate more economic abundance that would then not only benefit the state, but also benefit humanity by solving a lot of material problems that social, political, and economic problems were grounded in. So those ideas kind of emerged uh, or, or, or uh, had staying power, but they were transformed in the process. Yeah, I mean, and then to return as well to the, the, the romanticists who sort of come out in a way um, of, of this sort of opposition. I mean, with Wordsworth, um, one of the things that's apparent um, in the book is that there's a there's like there's a class element there to a lot of these thinkers. We see that with Wordsworth, and then we see that with Ruskin. This sort of, um, I mean, uh, returning to Wordsworth in a bit, but for Ruskin, the arts and crafts movement, it's ultimately not that accessible to working class people. Like the the, the cost of beauty is 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 not that practical. But with but with but with Wordsworth, um, the book also uh, introduces uh, a sort of more humble counterpart in the in in, in the position of uh, John Clare. And he brings some really radical um, ideas to, uh, to 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 the stage, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, he's he's uh, long been a favorite of mine. Um, in particular, Claire writes these amazing poems about birds. Um, uh, he he was an avid bird watcher himself, um, and has a very very um, intimate um, relation with the non-human through through these birds. So in some ways, you might even say that Claire is anticipating the kinds of debates we're having now about how to move out of, a, of this cornucopian anthropocentric worldview into a world where we put biodiversity uh, and, the, and the maintenance of the carbon cycle at the center of, of politics and, and the economy. And that's really where we end up um, in in the final chapter and the um, conclusion. We argue that the whole the whole worldview, the ideology of neoclassical scarcity, has basically come up against the limits of the planet itself. We call this condition planetary scarcity, and and uh, it, it's clear that there's a worldview forming around the science of planetary scarcity, but we also emphasize that it's not, it's not obvious which path we're going to follow. There are many options. The planet might have to become vegan uh, in the future to sustain biodiversity, to put aside land, or it might follow a more technological path and geoengineer itself into a much more depleted kind of biodiversity than we have today. Um, there, are, there are multiple choices, some of them really frightening, other ones maybe happier. Um, uh, um, planetary scarcity we define in a pretty simple and straightforward way uh, as the condition where we're running out of, we're not running out of stock, we're not running out of resources like coal and oil and gas. In fact, we have too much of that. We have far more coal than we could possibly burn while keeping the Earth system stable. Um, uh, rather, we're, we're, we're running out of sinks. Uh, in other words, places where our pollution goes. Right? We've created neoclassical scarcity has created a world where a small portion of of uh, of the species um, over consumes resources and produces an, such enormous amounts of waste that they're putting strain on the capacity of the earth system to absorb waste, in particular carbon, right? But of course, there are also other threats here like plastics and phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, so, so the book ends with um, with a somewhat speculative, but I think also very realistic recognition that the age of neoclassical economics is is uh, passing, and that we're moving into uh, a world where the Earth system itself is going to make itself known and felt throughout um, uh, throughout. Uh, the human realm um and it's it's blindingly obvious as we speak new york where carl is sitting is shrouded in in this acrid smoke from canadian forest fires um and of course 
uh, this is only uh, news to um, people on the east coast of the U.S. It's been happening in the on the west coast and other places for for years now. Um, so clearly, we're 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 facing a new material reality. And one way to put to put this is that we have left behind the stable conditions that nourished complex societies during the Holocene epoch, the relatively stable period of um, climate and biodiversity of the last 11,000 years, and that we've now moved into a new condition. Some some scientists call it the Anthropocene, um, right, which will be characterized, unfortunately, by a much more volatile climate, much more, uh, much greater extremes. Um, so, so we we end the book with a plea um, that whatever economics um, we can invent for the Anthropocene ought to be oriented towards repair rather than infinite growth. Now, that might still be a world where we have some element of growth. Um, it's going to take a lot of infrastructure and a lot of labor and new kinds of technology to clean up the mess that we've made. Um, but any kind of repair work is is ultimately aimed towards restoring the integrity of, of uh, the biosphere, restoring some of the biodiversity and the stable climate we've had, right? So, so it means that humans will have to retreat and and create uh, uh, a um, an economic worldview that acknowledges the value of the non-human. So this now we come full circle back to to uh, John Clare. Um, um, you know, Clare you could think of as a prophet of of uh, this kind of new way of being in the world, where the human and the non-human are uh, intensely entangled and intertwined and where humans do their utmost to um, to live respectfully um, with the non-human, right? What Claire was trying to do in his little village uh, in, in the 1830s and 18, uh, 1820s, um, uh, uh, we need to do now on, the, on a planetary scale. And, and if I may... Um, um, play the role of, of, of the interviewer here. Uh, I was wondering, Frederick, if you could also talk a little bit more about the kind of long durée idea of humanity recognizing nature as a co-producer of, of wealth and a recognition that goes all the way back to Adam Smith that, you know, when we work and we transform nature, we're really doing half the work and nature is doing a large part of it. And it's the recognition of that that um, we also need to incorporate into um, in, into our worldviews in the future. And, and perhaps you can say a thing or two about, about plankton. Well, Carl, you, you put it rather well yourself, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll try to add a little bit more to that. Yeah, yeah, there is, besides this cornucopian idea that humans are masters uh, who can transform nature and turn it into whatever we like, uh, can create new species, uh, can make gold out of dirt, um, uh Almost from uh, from the beginning, we've also had a counter ideology or a counter position that we call the finitarian worldview, right? And it's actually a number; it's an umbrella term for a number of ways of thinking about the finitude of nature. Um, and I think one of the most interesting elements in finitarian uh, thought is this idea that human humans uh, thrive only thanks to non-human um, forces, uh, and that we thrive the most when we enter into a, a conscious partnership with a non-human. And you're right, that's in Smith. It's also in, uh, for example, Charles Darwin. Darwin, in his little brilliant essay from um, 
uh, from uh, very late in his life uh, on the earthworms. He he uh, he proposes that agriculture, human agriculture, is in fact just a kind of pale imitation of the work done by earthworms. Right, long before the invention of the plow, earthworms were plowing the soil. He says so. That gives you a nice sense of a kind of a very different idea of the human non-human uh, relation, where we, we yes, we can have power, we can flourish, but we're always doing that in imitation and in deference to the larger forces of nature. In other words, nature is the conditional possibility for human labor, for human designs, for human creativity. Um, Plankton is another uh, uh, version of this argument uh, where um, we very, very recently, uh, uh, scientists working on on the health of the ocean, on on the ecosystems of the ocean, have made this horrifying discovery that... um, Plankton uh, at the base of of, uh, oceanic food systems is also a major source, a major sink for for carbon. Um, That in fact, uh, oceans play a key role and planktons, these microorganisms in the oceans, play a key role in keeping the entire earth system stable. Um, we know very little about how plankton operate in the ocean, what make, what allows them to thrive, and what might kill them. Um, what we, what is becoming increasingly clear is that if the plankton, um, if the world of plankton um, diminishes, um, it may really uh, make life on Earth much more difficult, much more difficult because they they not only absorb carbon, but also produce oxygen for the atmosphere. Um, uh, So plankton, I think, is a a welcome for us and for uh, the neoclassical economists, I think a very unwelcome reminder (laughs) that humans are not in charge, um, that we are much more dependent on nature than the cornucopian tradition has, has imagined that this whole idea of mastery is in many ways an illusion brought on by ignorance of the natural system and ignorance of unintended consequences. And let me add add one final bit uh, to our conversation. Uh, The the material uh, plays a big role in the book in as much as, as Carl said, um, Worldviews can come and go, um, but they're anchored in specific social and material forces, specific technologies, specific social uh, uh, forms of organization. And neoclassical scarcity, we argue, could never have um, become dominant without the transformation wrought by industrialization and by fossil fuels. Uh, Yet the irony here, of course, is that it's those fossil fuels, it's the carbon emissions from fossil fuels that are now jeopardizing the stability of the Earth system. So the kind of the kind of glorious rush, the great acceleration, the the thriving, the the growth we've seen has been predicated on on uh, this uh, blow um, to the ecological foundation of human life. Um, and economists have been too high on their own on their own models to recognize this, too unwilling to see beyond their own very narrow worldview. Yeah, I mean, I think this interrelation between humans and thinking about um, the the sort of the, the to and the fro rather than just a, an exploitative uh, one way take thing. I mean, we're definitely seeing growth in that amongst anthropologists. Um, I mean, there's Anna Singh who has done a wonderful project. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Um, that looks at this relationship and about how how these rela- uh, these relationships work and a little bit like your work what what might they offer um, for future uh, thought and as we're getting to the end of our time I was hoping I could briefly ask um, in the process of researching this book there was quite clearly a copious amount of reading going on um, so I was wondering if I could get one thinker event um, text that why the surprised or really interested you um, that you came across during this sort of process? 
Well, I've already talked a bit about John Clare. Um, so I would warmly recommend if if you want to have a a, a go at his poetry, you know, his uh, there's a cheap Oxford edition of his collected poems that includes most of the bird poems. So that's that's one nice starting point. Um, if you want to read something more recent um, that speaks to some of these questions, uh, you know, there, there, like you mentioned, Anat saying there, there are a number of social scientists now who are trying to reimagine the social sciences. Uh, Dipesh Chakrabarti is one of them. Um, Neil Brenner, another colleague of mine in sociology, is doing great work. Um, and uh, if your if your taste runs into fiction, um, how about Ursula Le Guin, um, the wonderful California and science fiction writer and ethnographer of the future? She has this beautiful short story called um, "The Author of the Acacia Seed," um, which is about uh, it's a near near future story of of uh, an academic conference focused on the languages of animals and plants. So basically in, in the near future, linguistics has moved into the non-human and we have begun to decipher how penguins talk to each other. And so this, enti- this incredible new universe of, of uh, ideas and emotions have opened up. Um, but it's only the beginning, it, it turns out, because even the most the lowest forms of plant life, quote lowest forms, end up um, having uh, having languages. So so there's a there's a wonderful there's a um, she imagines someone giving a paper on how lichen talk to each other. Um, if you think about it, actually, if you've been following the news on plant sensibility, we're it's uh, we're, we're halfway to Le Guin's world at this point, I think. Um, well, I, 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 let, let me take that that question in a in a slightly different direction, as opposed to giving you a sense of uh, specific things to read. What was astonishing to both of us um, was how little it is, little uh, there is to read in economics about climate change. Um, you know, they're constantly criticized for uh, not embracing these challenges because their methodology is not particularly well suited to it. Um, But, uh, and here, let me, um, uh, there's only 32 abstracts of 19,000 articles published in the top five economics journals from 1957 to uh, to, uh, 2019 that include climate change and global warming in the abstracts. And there are even fewer who include those terms in the title. Um, you know, th- there is a kind of um, sense in which economists are, you know, they will, they will pay lip service uh, and they will suggest that they are concerned and that they have things to say about these massive challenges confronting us, uh, but the evidence is quite paltry on what they are actually doing. Um, So um, we hope that, again, that this book that we've written can just bring attention to the peculiarity of this moment we're in and the unnaturalness of of economic growth. the fact that Homo sapiens has has, has existed um, uh, and, and all, only for for point zero 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 seven percent of Homo sapiens' existence in, in on Earth has there ever been a thing called exponential economic growth? It, it is a relatively, or it is a very unnatural condition for humanity, and. Um, it is unsustainable in the way it's being um, it, in the way that it's that it's 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 um, it, it's occurring in the process of economic growth at the moment, and it really is something that is of you know, dire importance for us to begin thinking about new social scientific approaches to um, you know to these conditions. 
Um, it's not something that we want to be alone in doing. We want other people to join us in this enterprise. Um, ours is a story of how we've thought about the economy nature relationship in the Western world from the 1500s onwards. Uh, but we need more stories. We need more approaches. And especially as we move into the future, we can't just draw on, on, on what Western thinkers have left us with. We need to pool our resources, our intellectual resources and our approaches uh, from all over the world and throughout history. So we're hoping that this book is an invitation for others and other intellectual historians, anthropologists, political theorists, and economists to join us in, in, in this effort to, um, to develop alternatives. I mean, that's very heartening to hear. Um, before I started this PhD, I actually did a, a master's in Chinese philosophy in Beijing, and uh, there was a, a resurgence there. Well, I mean, a resurgence or whether it was a, 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 an, inve an innovation um, amongst scholars engaging with Taoism, especially to think about their sort of, which brings us back to Le Guin, um, this sort of ebb and flow of, um, of nature as this um, thing that's much bigger than ourselves and also living in harmony. I think that's the, that's the sort of the, the key point is this, uh, this avoidance of dominance. Um, and I mean, that's often how the sort of Confucian Taoist yeah. divide is structured. Um, the one is dominance, one is going with the flow. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, on that note, one one tiny question: What's next? Well, so I'm I'm trying to write a book on uh, on the relationship between um, um, well, it, 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 the relationship between be, between natural knowledge and political economy in the formation of a an improvement discourse in 17th century Sweden. Uh, it's a book about um, failed empire. It's a book about um, various grandiose ideas and plans uh, for how to turn Sweden and Scandinavia into a world power. Um, it's a story of how that fails, but it's also a story of how the ideas survive through Linnaeus and those ideas are transplanted throughout the world and they become instrumental in um, stretching and expanding and disseminating ideas about capitalism and colonialism and improvement worldwide. Swedish cornucopianism, huh? Yeah, um, I'm working on um, on a parallel project uh, that really draws from um, from the scarcity book and the conversations with Carl, um, but follows a, a different methodology. It's an energy history of uh, the coming of fossil fuel to Britain um, and the emergence of a national economy. Um, but unlike uh, some colleagues who have gone at this very narrowly through the factory system, the idea behind my book is to cast a wide net and think about all the different ways in which uh, fossil fuel is entangled, um, is imbricated with social relations, um, with new kinds of technologies from the deep mine of Northumberland and Durham, the canal system of the Midlands, to the household uh, and the iron industry and the state. So I begin in, in really a little bit earlier than other histories of the fossil transition. I begin around 1760 uh, and I go up to 1870. So it's in some ways getting at the same problems that we discuss in the in the scarcity project, but but with a more environmental, ecological, and energy oriented frame. Well, as someone currently in County Durham, I'm I'm very grateful that we're getting the attention that we probably deserve. After all, we are the, the home of the railways. <laughs> That's um, right. And, and on that note, I'd like to thank both Professor Vanelind and Professor Albritton Jonsson for joining me today. Their book. Scarcity, a history from the origins of capitalism to the climate crisis is out now with Harvard University Press. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Thomas.